Welcome everybody. I wanna thank everyone for joining us tonight. Uh, my name is Karina Kowalski and I'm the manager of education here at the Mercer Museum in Fontel Castle. Um, we're so excited all of you are joining us today for this virtual um, program and lecture. Um, we're really looking forward to diving deep into learning about preserving family history. I know personally it's something that I'm excited to learn about to be able to share with my family um, and preserve some of that information before um, it gets lost. So. Um, before we dive into tonight's pro program, I just want to invite anyone um, who's interested in learning more about the museum or learning about what we've got on uh, upcoming this coming summer and into the fall, please check out our website mercermuseum.org um, for all upcoming events um, and tickets to the Mercer Museum and Fontail Castle. Um, you are more than welcome to find anything there. So without further ado, I am going to introduce um, Annie Halliday, our Library and Archives Manager, um, who will be delivering tonight's program. Um, so Annie, uh, take it away. Hello, good evening, everybody. I'm so excited to speak with you tonight about basic preservation practices. Again, my name is Annie Halliday, and I am the Library and Archives Manager here at the Museum's Research Library, uh, which is located on the third floor of the Mercer Museum in Doylestown. It's also where I'm speaking to you tonight. The library is currently open to the public Tuesday through Saturday, and admission to the library is included in a museum entrance ticket or in a museum membership. Uh, we also, uh, the library, we also offer remote research services such as research by mail, document retrieval, obit retrieval, and even if you're not able to physically come in person to the library, we still have many services which can provide you access to the collection and help answer any of your research questions. The library staff are devoted to collecting, preserving, and cataloging historic documents such as personal papers, diaries, maps, photographs, and ephemera. We are also the depository for Bucks County government records dating from 1683 to the 1930s. Our work ensures these items are preserved so they remain accessible to researchers in the future. In order to do that, one large aspect of my job is assessing new donation or already processed collections for any storage needs. If you're attending tonight's talk, then you're likely a history enthusiast, a family historian, or have a personal collection. I get asked a lot of questions about uh, by researchers, donors, and even my family and friends about how to handle and store certain items. They're often worried about family heirlooms and want to make sure they're treating the historic items with the utmost care. Whenever dealing with the collection, I perform a storage assessment. This assessment requires me to leaf through the entire collection or donation and flag any concerns. Concerns can include ripped or torn items, things that have had too much exposure to light, mold, pest damage, or damage caused by poor storage. Mitigating storage and preservation concerns differs slightly from format to format. What is required for documents may be different for scrapbooks or photographs. Unfortunately, I'm not able to tackle every preservation or storage question in tonight's talk, but I will absolutely try to cover the most common concerns or problems that I see. Before we move on, I do want to touch on some words or terms that I'll be using frequently tonight. If there are additional words you would like clarification on, please feel free to drop them in the Q&A and I can go over them at the end of the lecture. Often you'll hear archivists talk about things being acid free. You may wonder why that's important. Acid is a chemical substance that can weaken cellulose in paper and cloth. Normal household paper contains acid in order to break up the wood fibers during manufacturing. Over time, this weakening causes the paper to become brittle and flake away. Acidic items are either inherently acidic or were introduced to acid through the environment. Acid-free means that the item was purposely manufactured to be free of those acids and have a pH of 7.0 or higher. Acid-free paper is typically made from alpha cellulose and is lignin-free. However, acid items may over time through the presence of chlorine from bleaching, aluminum sulfate from sizing or pollution lead to the formation of acid unless the paper or board has been buffered with an alkaline substance. Which leads us to the term buffered versus unbuffered. Acid free items that are buffered means that there is an additional layer of protection to stop acid from building up. 
That sounds like something you want in all storage materials, but items with animal protein should not come into contact with buffered paper. That includes wool, leather, blueprints, animal specimens, feathers, and parchment. Buffered storage materials are ideal for most of the artifacts we will be discussing today. Manuscript is a phrase that normally has some confusion around it. I'll be discussing different types of manuscripts in tonight's talk. A manuscript is a handwritten or unpublished document. Most archival items in our collection are manuscripts. This includes diaries, scrapbooks, ledgers, and personal papers. Loose objects. They can be found in different places, but commonly they are found between the pages of a bound item. The bound item can be a scrapbook, a published book, etc. Examples of loose items are flowers pressed between the pages of a book, a ticket stub, a newspaper clipping, a calling card, or a scrap of paper with notes scribbled on it. Shown here are two loose items I removed from ledgers I've processed. I love the one on the right and the fact that someone saved it. Processing is a common activity I do as an archivist. Processing a collection contains several steps and means that the archivist has completed an assessment of the entire collection of materials. Processing prepares the collection for public use for, uh, by researchers. This entails creating an arrangement or organization, rehousing materials, and completing a finding aid which contains a full inventory. I just used a word that you will hear a lot tonight, rehousing. Rehousing relates to storing the collection. If something is donated to us in falling apart acidic cardboard box, then I would rehouse the collection and place it into an acid-free archival quality document box. Rehousing is where the archivist deals with storage and preservation concerns. The image on the left shows a recent donation of black and white negatives. This has been kept in acidic envelopes in a falling apart shoe box in a plastic tub in somebody's garage. The image on the right shows a similar negative collection after it's been properly rehoused. The negatives are in archival quality envelopes and an acid-free box, which is also labeled. Interleaving means inserting blank pages in between pages of a bound item. Typically you interleave acid-free paper to protect items from leaching acid into each other. Now that we've covered some basic terms and concepts, let's bust some common myths around archival practices and storage methods. We are gonna test your knowledge and I'm gonna ask you some true or false questions. And I would love for people to type your answer, true or false, into the chat. True or false, I should wear gloves to handle papers and bound items. This protects the materials from the damaging oils on my hands. Please drop your answer in the chat. I'm very curious. I got true, true, false, true, true, true. Lots of trues. I got a yes, but. <laughs> Linen gloves, great question. False, okay, great, awesome. You guys will be very surprised to hear. False, the answer is false. The number one myth that I commonly hear about in my work is wearing gloves while handling historic documents. I totally understand that wearing gloves feels very cool and fancy and like what the professionals use, but we actually don't. Research has found that gloves can dull the sensitivity in your hands and uh, can actually lead you to damage an item more than you intend to than if you were barehanded. Um, it just, you're more likely to be rough with the item versus if you have your, your sensitive nerve endings and you can feel how hard you're pulling or touching on an item. To handle historic documents or books, all you need are clean, dry hands. True or false? I shouldn't use tape or repair to repair torn or ripped historic documents. It's better to leave them damaged. Drop your answer in the chat. True, true, lots of trues. Yeah. Oh, wow. Everyone seems to be in agreement. I love that. And you are totally correct, true. That most tapes are incredibly acidic and will transfer that acid to the document. As you can see here, this photograph is an item in one of our collections that someone has repaired with some tape and you can see that it has turned bright yellow over time. Um, it's completely acidic, it's very brittle. And unfortunately I cannot get that tape off that item. So over time, the tape will turn yellow and brittle and affect whatever it is that you repaired. It is also incredibly difficult to remove, remove in the future. Repairing paper is very fiddly work, so when in doubt, it's better just to leave it torn or ripped. 
Just make sure you keep the pieces together. True or false? Plastic bins or bags are the best way to store items. It protects them from water damage. Drop your answer in the chat. False. True. True. False. Guilty. <laughs> I love that. There's no shame. False, false, false. Awesome. Great. The answer is false. So a lot of you got that right. Um, I commonly receive donations in large plastic tubs. And again, I totally get it. They're easy to find, they're cheap, and they feel like they do the job. Unfortunately, most plastics include PVC. In order to make PVC flexible, plasticizers are added during manufacturing. These compounds can damage archival materials by releasing chemical gases into the air and break down the materials in a surprisingly short amount of time. PVC can also be found in photo pages and can seem oily to the touch and look yellow. Plastic bins can also create microclimates where humidity and temperature can build up and slowly damage items. Ironically, board boxes are the best means to store items because they can be acid-free and buffered, as we just talked about. They allow things to off-gas and better ensure the longevity of your archival items. If water damage is a concern, make sure the boxes are stored off the ground in case of flooding or are start, stored on shelving with a, a top so that leaks cannot fall directly onto the boxes. Now we're gonna discuss some best practices. I have some general best practices that are applicable to most archival items. They are extremely simple, but you'd be surprised how infrequently people do them. My friends and family are so sick of hearing me talk about them, but I promise they will help. Label everything. I mean everything. I talk about context a lot, but it truly is the best way to preserve your items. You have to imagine 100 years from now when these items are handed down to future generations or donated to a historical society, what information will they need? You can't count on everyone knowing the dates of an event, where the family summer home was, or who that person is in that photograph. Nothing breaks my heart more than an unlabeled photograph with no information about who is in it or when and where it was taken. If you can discreetly label an item with background information, those in the future will thank you. I also encourage you to write down what you know, even if it's a list of birth and death dates, a family tree where people lived or an important memory, that can be crucial information for a family historian or genealogist. You want to label things in pencil or an acid-free pen such as a Micron. You do not want to use Sharpies or, ball or ballpoint pens. Pencil allows for easy updates or changes if necessary and doesn't leach into the item. Also, pencil means if you accidentally drop it onto a pile of papers, you are potentially leaving giant permanent marks. Most of the items you are looking to protect are currently fragile or will be soon. The best method for protecting these items is to handle them as little as possible. Every time you open a photo album or unfold a letter, you are degrading that item a little more. The spine weakens, the paper tears or flakes, and eventually the item becomes unstable. Creating digital copies of items is a fantastic way to limit handling. That way, you can easily show off that beautiful watercolor your great-grandmother made or flip through a scrapbook with your cousins. Of course, that doesn't mean you can't look at the actual items every once in a while, but this will absolutely help cut down on how much the item degrades over time. Layers of protection. You want to provide as many layers of protection as possible. An example is a letter in an acid-free folder in an acid-free box. The box absorbs any potential light, humidity, or dust damage, which protects the folder, which supports and protects the letter from tearing. Each storage item does a different but important job in protecting your collection. Now we will begin to talk through some different common item formats you may have in your collection. One of those forms are documents or papers. This can mean a letter, personal writings, something along those lines. And whenever I receive a collection of papers as a donation, I first go through all of them and survey them. I assess if there's any major damage, such as mold or pests. I then work through the following steps. Remove any fasteners. I remove any fasteners that may have come with the document. Metal fasteners, such as staples, paper clips, binder clips, etc. These metal items can rust over time and stain the paper like what is shown here on the left. These can be replaced with plastic clips, which are essentially plastic paper clips. 
An example is shown here on the right and is sold by Gaylord Archival. They come in a variety of sizes and colors for you know, different thickness. And if you're you know, just a few documents or a lot of documents, they have bigger ones for various sizes and you can order them easily from most online retailers. Rubber bands can also damage items. They dry out over time, become brittle, break apart, as shown here on the picture on the left. This crispy rubber band was wrapped around a map from our collection. Bits of rubber band pieces can also adhere to the papers they are wrapped around. I remove all rubber bands when I find them. If one has already attached itself to the paper, I use a micro spatula to gently scrape the pieces off. If the rubber band doesn't give away easily, I leave them alone. It's better not to create a tear. An example of a micro spatula is shown at the top right image. If you remove the rubber band and you still want the item to remain rolled up, I suggest using cotton string to tie the item. This is acid free and won't adhere to the paper over time. Weed out duplicates. I understand the instinct to save as many copies of a thing as possible. This can be an advertisement, a program from an event, anything that has been made in mass. It is not necessary to keep more than three copies of any identical item. I always spend some time weeding a collection for duplicates. This mostly comes down to storage space. For most of us, storage space and materials are precious, so shouldn't be wasted on storing tons of duplicates. If something is on super acidic paper, then it usually should be photocopied onto acid-free paper and the original discarded. If you're worried about losing any special qualities about the original item, you can create a high quality color scan in addition to photocopying it. Acidic paper will degrade and yellow over time. It also can leach onto other items and quote, burn it as is shown here. The pages of the scrapbook shown here are very acidic. You can see where the clover and the envelope have protected the opposite page from turning brown with acid. If you cannot discard the original item, you want to interleave it with acid-free paper. And we'll go into more detail on how to do that for scrapbooks in a little bit. Once these steps have been taken, you can then work on getting everything into proper housing. Documents want to be stored in acid-free folders that are then stored in acid-free boxes. An example of a typical acid-free folder is on the left, and on the right you can see a type of document box we use here in the archives. As previously, as previously mentioned, the layers of protection help save the item from being exposed to too much dust or light. Typically, documents will fit in either a legal or letter-sized folder and document box. You want to make sure you pick the folder that best fits the item. When I'm surveying a collection, I look to see if there are going to be legal sized documents so I know what folders and boxes to use. One important tip is to never put letter sized folders in a legal sized box. If the folder is smaller than the box, then things are more likely to shift around and an item can slide out and get damaged or fall out of the folder and lose its context. Anything that is folded wants to be unfolded. Creases weaken paper, and when you work with older documents, you will likely see letters or advertisements that have torn along the fold. This is why it's important to see what size folder will best for your items. If a large item has been folded to fit in a smaller folder, then you want to upgrade it to the appropriate size. If you have a collection of letters, I also recommend removing the letters from the envelopes, unfolding them, and plastic clipping it to the envelope. That way the letter can store flat, but it doesn't get separated from the envelope, which can have important information such as sender or recipient and dates from postmarks. All folders should be labeled in pencil with clear handwriting and succinct but descriptive titles. You don't want to make the titles too long so it's not clear what's in the folder. If you have additional information or history around something that's being stored in a folder, then write it up and include it in the folder. A typical folder label I will create will sound like correspondence 1915 to 1920 or financial documents 1989. You always want to include date information in the title. Also, do not use abbreviations. These abbreviations can be lost to time and folks in the future won't be able to understand what it means. Write out the entirety of a person's name or include any nicknames they may have gone by. Once the items are foldered and the folder is labeled, then you want to put it in a box. This box should also be labeled. You can either pencil it on the front or create labels and print them off a computer. You want to make sure the box title is clear and descriptive. 
When I'm processing an archival collection that will be held here in the library, I assign all the collections a name such as the Henry Chapman Mercer Papers or Bucks County Historical Society records. They are also assigned a unique collection number. For your purposes, you can name the box after a specific branch of the family it covers or that it's all letters or photographs, whatever feels right. The next format we will discuss is newspapers. I often get asked about how to store newspapers. They are a great resource for information such as obituaries, marriage announcements, or if their family member was lucky enough to have an article written about them. The issue is that newspaper is famously acidic, especially older historic ones. They will become brittle and flake away over time. They also endanger other documents and can burn them. If you have newspaper in your archives, then you may have seen it leave a brown impression on other paper it's stored with. My honest opinion is that if you have newspaper cl clippings, I would scan or photocopy them and then discard the original. While you're making a new version of the clipping, be sure to capture what newspaper the clippings are from and the date. If you make a photocopy, write that information on the back in pencil or include it in the metadata of the digital file. Here's an example of an original newspaper clipping with a photocopy created on acid-free paper. If you really want to keep the original newspaper, then you want to store it flat in an oversized box alone. You should remove anything that isn't newspaper from the box. If there are multiple newspapers to store, then I suggest either interleaving it with buffered paper or folder them individually. The box wants to live in a cool, dark place and be handled as little as possible. This is an item I highly recommend scanning or photocopying to limit handling. Newspaper was not built to be safe forever and will continue to flake despite utilizing these best practices. Here we are at photographs. Truly the most common questions I get are around photographs. People are curious how to store them properly so that they can be looked at for years to come. Photographs and negatives are the one instance where you do want to use gloves to handle them. The oils from your hands can easily transfer to the photograph and damage them. If you don't have access to gloves, then hold them by the extreme edges and don't touch the surface directly. Dry, clean hands are always key. Photographs want to be sleeved individually. You can either place them in acid-free paper envelopes, uh, polypropylene photograph pages, or polypropylene pockets. Paper enclosures, as shown on the left, will protect your photographs from damage caused by light. Plastic sleeves, as shown on the right, are clear, which makes viewing them easy, but provides no light protection. If you store them in paper envelopes, then you can place them in folders or an acid-free shoebox, as shown on the left. The polypropylene, polypropylene photograph pages are easy to purchase. They are also designed to either sleeve a photo individually or you can store multiple photographs in a page. Some are three hole punch so you can place them in a binder of some kind. Again, you wanna be careful with metal elements in your storage materials. You don't want them to rust and affect the item. Ideally, it should be a archival quality binder such as the one shown on the right. Gaylord Archival sells great kits such as this for storing photographs. Don't let your photographs lose their context. You can label them in pencil or micron on the back. You can scan them and include the information in the file name. However it works best for you is fine. Just make sure you do it. You want to record who is in the photo, where it was taken, and when it was taken whenever possible. If you can include any family tree information, such as this photograph of Lois Wegman's sister to Francis Wegman was taken in 1969 at our house in Brooklyn. This provides incredible context and helps illustrate the family tree. Most of us inherit or purchase framed photographs. While this is a great way to display them, photographs shouldn't be stored in frames in the long term. When a photograph is hanging on the wall, it is exposed to a lot of light. Also, most framing materials contain acid of some kind and can damage them. I recommend removing the original photograph from the frame and storing them in a box. I should mention there are frames that are equipped with glazed UV acrylic that better protects the item, but there are no guarantees that will last forever. When in doubt, create a high quality scan of the photograph, then print and frame that. The original can live peacefully in a dark box and looked at safely every once in a while. These photos are examples of acid-free frame kits you can purchase from Gaylord Archival.
There is a certain kind of photo album that was popular in the 60s and 70s that is my mortal enemy. We receive them with donations all the time, and you probably know what I'm talking about. You probably have them in your collections. The pages are slightly sticky and are covered in a thin piece of clinging plastic. You place the photographs on the page, then place, then lay the plastic over them, which supposedly help hold them in place. These albums are terrible for long-term storage of photos. The static cling that holds the images in place can wear out, so all the photos slide around the page and can fall out of the album completely. Or even worse, the plastic adheres even more over time and can no longer be safely peeled back without damaging the photos. If you're able to safely remove photographs from these albums, please do so sooner rather than later. If you have received a photo album where all the photos are glued or taped down to the pages, there are a few ways to safely remove them. You can either use a micro spatula or waxed dental floss to slowly tease the photo away from the album page. You want to work the spatula or floss slowly between the photo and page um, to break through the adhesive. This is delicate work, so don't rush it because you could easily tear through the photo. If it won't lift up and there's nothing on the back of the page, you could always cut the photograph out so there's still album page on the back, but at least you can store it in better housing. Bounded manuscripts is a general term for things like scrapbooks, diaries, or ledgers. Most personal archival collections contain one or more of these objects. We have an entire collection of them here in the Mercer Museum archives. I'm fortunate enough to work with them frequently. And there are a few practices I recommend for storing the items for the long term. One of my favorite types of archival items are scrapbooks. Scrapbooks are an incredible insight into the creator's personality. What items they saved, how it's formatted, any fun notes they leave on the pages are all wonderful ways to learn about who made it. Funnily, archivists usually are not a fan of scrapbooks, typically because they can be difficult to store properly. Due to the hodgepodge nature of what's kept in a scrapbook, you could be dealing with several different types of items. There could be photographs, 3D objects, and newspaper all on one page. There are a few ways to handle storing scrapbooks. It's really up to you and how you want to, uh, how you want to view it that determines the best method. First, ask yourself if you want to keep the scrapbook intact or disassemble it. Whatever your decision is, I first recommend creating a complete scan of the scrapbook from cover to cover, including blank pages. This scan captures the scrapbook's original order and layout. That way, if a page falls out or an item detaches, you know what the creator originally intended. You can create the scan either using a flatbed scanner, a specially designed book scanner, or even using a digital camera or cell phone. But again, you want to make sure you do the entire thing in order. If you want to keep the scrapbook intact, then I recommend at the very least interleaving acid-free paper between each page. This paper will provide a barrier between acidic and non-acidic items attached to the scrapbook pages. The image shown here is an example of interleaving. You can see the paper has been cut to size and has been placed in between each page. If you want to give the scrapbook the best shot at surviving over the years, then I would disassemble it. That means removing it from whatever the binding is. Some scrapbooks are in binders or are bound with string, which have metal or acidic elements. They degrade over time and will usually fall apart with repeated use anyway. If you're able to safely remove the pages from the binding, then you can store the pages more easily in folders or clear acid-free sleeves. If you decided to sleeve or folder the pages, I would number them somehow so that you can store them in the correct order. But fear not. If they fall out of order, you've already created your scan for reference. One example is if a scrapbook is stored in a binder, it's inevitable that the holes will tear and the pages will be loose. Archival supply companies make acid-free binders that can hold clear three-hole punch acid-free sleeves that fits sheets of paper. This means the stress of turning pages is now on the sleeve and no longer on the delicate paper. Journals and diaries, of course, wonderful ways to learn about a person. Some can be boring observations about the weather, or some offer in-depth views into how a person spent their time or what they were feeling. Regardless, there's always something, uh, an important insight into a person's life. These types of bound manuscripts can take many forms and are harder to disassemble. I will usually leave them as is and work on getting them into acid-free housing. You can buy a clamshell box, shown here on the left, which stores the items flat. 
If you go this route, you want to get a box that's as close to the size of the item as possible. Again, you don't want things shifting around too much in its housing. You want it to be snug, but not too tight that it's causing any damage. If you cannot get an acid-free box with the exact right dimensions, you can always wrap it in acid-free tissue paper. The tissue paper provides padding and keeps the volume in place. If you want to store it in an acid-free document box, say there are a few slim volumes you want stored together in one box, then you want to store it with the spine facing down, as demonstrated on the right. This puts less stress on the item. If you put it with the opening down, then things are likely to slump and the pages can be folded or damaged. Interleaved objects can appear in anything such as a scrapbook, a diary, or a Bible. They're usually loose objects that have been inserted in between pages of something else. The loose item may be related to whatever's on the page of the item or have no relation at all. Some examples are ticket stubs, receipts, and pressed botanicals. Either way, you wanna make sure they are housed properly and that you know where they were found within the volume. One way to do that is by noting what pages it was found in between. For example, if you find a small scribbled note between pages five and six of a ledger, you want to remove the item, put it in a folder, and label the folder something along the lines of loose object removed from pages five and six of the 1915 ledger, or pressed flowers removed from the back of Elizabeth Morris's 1922 diary. That way, if what's written on the page references the ticket stub or receipt that was placed there, you can still look at the item, but it no longer can accidentally fall out or damage the paper in the volume. Shown here is a scrap of paper removed from a volume and the label of the folder that it lives in. The final format we will be discussing are published volumes. Family Bibles are one type of published item that requires special housing. We have a wonderful special collection of Bibles here in the library. They are a valuable resource for genealogists because it was customary to track birth and death information of family members in them. This could be recorded on either the front or end covers or in a special blank section in the middle. We keep our Bibles in our dark climate controlled vault. They are stored flat on their back covers so the spines are not stressed. If you are responsible for a family Bible, I recommend placing it in a clamshell box. This is a great layer of protection and will help stave off any light damage accumulation. I recommend creating a digital version of any special annotations in the Bible. That way you can easily reference any of the important birth, death, or marriage information with, uh, while limiting handling the item. As we talked about earlier, you want to limit handling as much as possible. You always want to be sure to check for any loose or interleaved items that may be tucked between the pages. If you do find items, then note where you've located them, remove them, and folder them separately. Some of you may have special published books in your collection. Those are okay to store either in a clamshell box laid flat on their cover or spine down. If you have a volume, published or unpublished, with a detached cover or loose binding, you can tie them with some cotton string. That gives, you, uh, that gives everything extra support or ensures that no parts of the volume go missing. You simply tie the book up similar to gift wrapping a present. And one thing you wanna make sure to do is that the knot goes at the top of the volume. If the knot is on the spine or either cover, then the pressure of the string can damage the item. Thank you so much for coming to tonight's talk. I know I threw a lot of information out there at you. So please feel free to drop any questions in the chat uh, or the Q&A and we can hopefully answer some of them. Thanks. Thank you, Annie, that was amazing. I've already made my Gaylord list that I will be purchasing from. <laughs> I see a Jackie has raised her hand. Jackie, I believe I can um, allow you to talk. So I'm gonna do that. All right, Jackie, you are able to unmute and ask your question. Can you hear me now? Yes. Thank you. When I scan something onto acid-free paper, does the ink in the, from the toner, from the printer harm it? No, um, is that acid free. It's you could purchase acid free, but it's okay if it's sort of conventional household ink or paper, because um, the ink is not going to damage the item. It's really just the acid that is within the paper itself that's going to do the most damage. So you're totally okay to use your household printer for that. And where can one find acid free paper? 
Acid-free paper is available. You can get it at places such as Staples. They sell acid-free paper. Um, I know I recently bought it from, I was buying some sleeves for photographs at the same time. There's this really great store in New York City called B&H, which sells um, archival quality photo sleeves. And they also sell acid-free paper and they have incredible shipping. It also gets to you like in two days, which is really great. Um, so they're, they're a great store to go to for acid-free paper. Thank you. Yeah. Another question. Um, I find that some boxes are pretty tightly filled. Is that a bad thing? Um, it's not a bad thing. My rule of thumb is that I usually, you want everything to be held upright. You don't want things to fall and slump or anything like that. So you want there to be enough sort of tension where everything's sort of held upright, but you also, don't want to feel any resistance if you're pulling anything out of a box. And of course, you want to make sure it's something that you can pick up. You don't want to overstuff it and then have it be hard to move um, because, you know, that's dangerous and also just not good for you. So, so you kind of want to find that happy balance of full, but not stuffed. <laughs> uh, one more. I, yeah. I've had the experience of finding one dead silverfish in a box. Mm. What to do? What to do? Yeah, silverfish are right. tricky. Yes, um, that's a good question. So of course you don't want to treat the items with anything. You don't want any pesticides or anything like that. Um, I usually find it's if you can find the. Um, it's usually about where you actually store the item. So silverfish are usually attracted to like more humid or wet places. So you want to make sure that it's some place that has like some level of humidity control. Um, and of course, not um, not too hot. You want it to be sort of a nice middle temperature. I think it's like usually between 68 and 72 is usually what you're aiming for, which I know is impossible to do right now in, in Pennsylvania. It's like 100 degrees, but you want to try and keep it someplace as uh, cool, um, humid free and dark as possible. Thank you for all the good advice. Yeah, of course. I see some things are in the chat. Let me find my... Uh, 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 great, I have my, Kimberly's asking, I have my great grandparents' wedding certificate is folded and has scotch tape. What is the best way to save this? Oh no. So scotch tape, unfortunately you might have to leave that. Um, I would recommend any tape removal be um, sort of outsourced to a professional conservator because they have at their disposal um, certain tools and chemicals that can release the tape from the item. Of course, that's like something I don't have access to and that's not readily available to most folks. Um, I know there are different conservation centers. There's the conservation center in Philadelphia that, um, that helps people with things like that. Um, if it is folded, I would try and find the box that would best fit the item. Um, Gaylord Archival, which is my sort of go-to archival supply company, they sell all types of boxes. You want sort of the flat ones with the deep lid. They're usually about three inches deep and they sell them from, they can be 18 to 24 inches big or they can be 30 to 40 inches big. You know, they, they sort of have every size for every document. So you definitely want to find a folder and a box that the document can then lay nice and flat in. Um, but hopefully that, that can help you out. I missed the name of the store. Can you please say it again? Oh, B and H. I don't know what B and H stands for, but it's in um, New York City. I'm like, I want to say Lower West Side, sort of Hill's Kitchen area. Let's see. I have a very large family Bible from the 1800s. Can you go over the family Bible information store and get acid-free clamshell box flat on back? Yes, I thought you had said a dark place. Yes, that's all. That is all completely correct. Um, you can buy a clamshell box. Again, you want to find a size that is as close to the item as you can get. But if you're not able to find the exact right size, you can get some acid-free tissue paper and you just sort of lightly wrap the item. And then that tissue paper creates like a nice little bumper in there. So in case something slides around, the book isn't, you know, hitting against the box wall. It's the the paper sort of absorbing any shock there. Um, and again, yes, cool, dark, uh, low humidity is the way to go for paper. Um, so anything like, I know attics, of course, are a common space. Um, that's usually going to be too hot. 
Um, and basements, I know, are <laughs> commonplace, and that's usually going to be too humid. So if you've got one of those things, maybe buy a humidifier, or if you've got a closet that no one's using or something like that, it might be better to move anything there. Um, do you have, rec have a recommended company for remind, uh, rebinding books? Um, we use a bindery um, to bind periodicals and things like that, um, but it's sort of a mass binding place. I send like cartons of books at one time. I don't know of a place that does individual binding offhand, um, but I'm sure that you could find something through a good Google search or, um, that, you know, there's tons of local places that can do things like that. What is the best way to remove a stuck photo on the glass plate in the frame? <sighs> That's tough. I mean, as I said, you can kind of get a micro spatula or some wax dental floss and see if you can tease the photo away, but you should probably be able to see through the glass if it's, um, if moisture has the photo stuck in place or what it is. If it's glue, then you ha will have maybe an easier time pulling it away, but moisture, you really want to be careful because if it was fully saturated then the photo has probably adhered to the glass. Um, so that that's a little trickier. It might be better just to leave it as is um, and either just store it in a box with the glass still attached, or you can reframe it in an acid free frame that, you know, all the backing and all materials are acid free. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a little tricky. You can usually pry them away, but uh, it's very like fiddly work. So you want to be careful. I always ask myself a question of like, how upset will I be if I totally destroy this? And if the answer is really, really upset, I will try not to touch it and just leave it as is. Um, I have a very large property deed. It's folded up small. It's crumpled in certain areas where it was folded. Do they make large boxes? They do. They make great large oversized boxes. Um, Again, Gaylord, my go-to, they're my best friends. I talk to them more than I talk to anybody else at this point. They sell tons of different types of sizes. Um, I would go to their website and search around to see what size works. I should also mention, they actually have this great sort of series of items called, I think it's called, um, it might be called Your Story, but they sell sort of, um, I don't want to say lower quality, but they sell slightly less expensive versions of archival quality items for people who are just trying to find things to store their personal collections. So you'll see like the super top tier, very expensive item, and then they'll have something that's usually a couple bucks cheaper, which is really nice. I highly recommend checking that out to see if they've got any, you know, good quality boxes that are maybe a little bit less money because it can get it can get pretty expensive um, buying archival items. For rolled items, is there a tip for flattening it for box storage? Um, so <laughs> we actually just created a social media post. If you go to our Instagram, I actually wrote up a really great how-to on how to humidify documents to flatten them. Um, because of course you can try rolling it flat and leaving weights on top of it and just hope like hope gravity over time sort of takes care of it. But if you have a really persistently rolled item that just does not want to flatten, you can create what's called a humidification chamber where, and it could be really simple. It can be a plastic bin, you know, with a lid. Um, you want to get some like grates or like something that is, um, that will hold items up but allow air to travel through. Like uh, I've seen people use like those shelving organizers that you can use to like put into cabinets that like create more shelves within a cabinet that are clear plastic. You fill it with a couple inches of room temperature, fresh water. You put the items on top of the grate or whatever it is that you purchased to hold it up out of the water. You put the lid on top, you seal it up and you leave it alone for a few hours. You set a timer, you come back and check it every once in a while. And slowly over time, what is happening is the humidity created by the water in the bottom of the bin is um, refreshing the document. And you can actually feel when you go back and sort of check in a few hours, the document starts to feel like a little squishy, like the fibers are just reinvigorated. You don't want it to get wet. You don't want it to be soggy. You don't want any saturation. You just want it to get a little of that ambient moisture from the air. And then once that's done that for a few hours, you can leave it under some weight. Um, I usually push press it between um, two pieces of foam core, which you can just buy from you know Staples or a dollar store or whatever leave it between the two things of foam core and put some weight on top and then leave that for a few hours and then come back to that. 
that was a really long explanation, but it's a great way to do it and is super easy to set up. There's like tons of articles about it online. Annie, there's a follow-up question to that. Um, yeah. They want to know if it applies to folded items. Um, folded items, you will have a way easier time just leaving underweight. Um, and the humidification chamber is great and totally safe, but if you don't have to expose it to moisture, then it's best not to. So a folded item will, will respond great to being pressed between two pieces of foam core. That's totally fine. It's just the rolled items, like they can be like so brittle and tight that it just, no matter how much weight you put it under, it's just going to spring right back up. Do you have any tips on what to keep? It's overwhelming to have thousands of photos and papers to sort and label and store. I completely understand that. <laughs> um, I mean, that that's kind of a, a, a personal question. I guess my first tip would be to go through and see what's completely lost its context, meaning something where you're just like, I have no idea who this person is in this photo, or I have no idea what this is, who made this, who created this. Um, and I would start to sort of weed out things like that, because if you don't know, then people down the line most likely are not going to know. Um, and again, you always want to weed out du duplicates. You don't want to keep a bunch of copies of a single type of item. You want to just make sure it, you're only keeping one, three at the most of anything. Um, so that's, that's sort of my recommendation. And of course you can always, if it's about physically storing things, you can always digitize photographs and then discard the original. So at least you have the digital version of. Um, so yeah, those are sort of, those are the first steps that I would take, but I, I completely appreciate that. Yes, we have lots and lots of stuff here that I'm just like, oh my God, when am I going to work on this? <laughs> And it looks like we had another question in the chat of how or where would I make digital copies of published items, Bibles, journals, et cetera? That's a great question. Um, so if you're, if you're only looking to capture the personal information in a Bible, then it can, it can be as simple as taking a photo on your phone um, and just framing it really like, you know, taking a nice down shot of it, having it, you know, well lit so that's legible and things like that. Or there are such things as um, book scanners, which let you capture the item with the face up. So that way, you know, with some fragile things, you don't want to flip it over and like, you know, jam a copier lid on it or something like that. So a book scanner will allow you to capture the item face up so it's nice and supported and it'll do a scan of the entire thing. Um, you can, there are some services that will do that for you. They'll capture it digitally for you. Or, um, you know, we have a book scanner here in the library that is open to people if they want to come in and create, you know, a PDF or something like that of, of certain information. Um, so it sort of depends on how fragile the item is and just how high quality you want it to be. If you're cool with a cell phone photo, then that's totally great. You know, that'll, that'll last. Um, I always suggest printing a hard copy of something like that as well, though, just in, so in case something happens, somebody's computer crashes or something like that, it's also good to have a hard copy of and it looks like we got some Q&A ones too. Um, how do you avoid straining spines when interleaving bound documents with acid-free paper? Oh, wow, what a great question. Um, you most likely are not gonna strain a spine because um, acid-free paper, it's not very thick. It's not like cardstock or anything like that. It's like a very thin, you know, it's, it feels a little bit thinner than copier paper. So I don't think you're going to strain the spine too much, but if you feel like the album is overstuffed, then you can always um, help support it by tying it with some string, as I sort of mentioned towards the end there. And that string, A, just make sure that, you know, it stays shut and also sort of supports everything. So that way it's taking some of the, the weight and strain off the spine itself. So you can kind of do two different things there. And then one other question, then I see Beth has her hand raised, so we will then um, have her ask her question. Is there an at-home way to test as acidi acidity? <laughs> there is, there is. Um, there is this great pen, it's called Abby, A-B-B-E-Y, and it's a pH tester pen. I don't know, we have one. I actually don't remember where we bought it. I think you can probably just Google, Google Abby pH pen and you'll find some vendor somewhere. But it's this great little pen. You just do like, you know, a little streak, just, you know, not that big. 
and it has an indicator so that it'll turn a certain color depending whether or not it's acidic or not. So if it turns purple, then it's neutral. If it turns yellow, then it's acidic. So it's a good thing that we'll do um, if folders have come with any items that have been donated or boxes or anything like that. And we look at it and we're like, oh, that could be okay. And then we'll just do a quick little line with our pen and we'll find out whether or not we should just toss whatever that is or um, it's okay to stay and we can keep it. Right now we got Beth. So Beth, you are good to unmute. Okay. I'm getting anxious just listening to you, Annie. <laughs> Describe what needs to be done to preserve family documents. What, what should I start with first? The scrapbook or the family Bible? I would start with the scrapbook because that's likely to have more acidic items in there um, or the glue could give away or the tape could give away and something could fall off. So that is a little bit less stable than a family Bible. Family Bible is fairly, fairly, you know, it's just going to kind of sit there and, you know, you'll open it every once in a while. Um, but a scrapbook has sort of ticking time bombs inside it that need to be dealt with. So you can of course, you want to scan it, you want to scan the entire thing or take pictures of it, you want to get that original order, and then you either want to disassemble it or keep it intact. Um, and then, you know, sort of based on what you decide, then do the, the steps from there. Okay, another, another second part to that question. But disassembling it to me means removing a lot of the character of the mm -hmm. item. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? No, I, I understand that. Yeah, uh, of course, there's, you know, there's always that balance that we strike. You want to make sure that it lasts forever, but you don't want to take away like the charm and or yes. the character oh. of the thing. Right. So if you want to keep it intact, you can totally do that. Um, you just want to interleave um, however you can. But the thing that, you know, again, the balance you're sort of striking is like, is it more important that I keep the character or that this thing lasts forever? <laughs> so depending on, you know, how and important the character is or you know of course it's dependent on the different types of scrapbooks there's so many different kinds different types of papers different types of binding so you know I'm this speaking have newspaper clippings in it newspaper clippings yeah so yeah you definitely want to interleave then for sure because the I'm sure you might have already noticed that the clipping is creating brown marks on on other things okay thank you you're welcome and that might be something to keep the character to take a picture of. I am not an archivist in any way, but I, that for me, if I had something like that, I would think that that would be to take that picture yes, now. Yes. Creating that scan is really great. And depending on what you use, it can still just be just as charming. You know, you can find in uncertain archives, their online databases or catalogs, they'll sometimes include things like this that they've digitized and they still feel nice like they still look like a handwritten handmade document again depending on the scanner you can really get a high quality very detailed scan that you can see the fiber of the paper you can see how everything's attached you can see the little handwriting mm -hmm. and everything there so you know there, there is a way to capture it where it doesn't feel you know clinical or you know too digital <laughs> all right I want to make sure we answer all the questions, um, but I know we've answered quite a few. Annie is definitely um, our resident expert on this, so we're so grateful for her to share her expertise and knowledge with all of us. Um, but if anyone has any last minute questions, feel free to pop them either in the Q&A and chat um, or um, yeah, it'd be wonderful. So we'll give everyone just a few minutes. Annie, I was already looking to purchase the kit as a Christmas present for my mother so that she can get started with her, our personal photo albums. I know it's something that she's been wanting to scan for a while um, and just sometimes having the time. She took over one my my childhood bedroom to be the photo room. Oh my God. I mean, you, so you have your own archive, basically. Is We're going to have our own archive, essentially. Great. Great. Yeah, I, Lord sells some really great kits. It has all the stuff in it. it. It, you know, you can just sort of search what you're trying to do. And there's some there's some already built things that are that make it really really easy. Um, or if you want to get creative and really build your own systems, then you can also do that. All right. 
And yes, I see a question. We did record tonight's program. Um, so Kim, I see that, um, yes, I will go ahead and send those of you who are late. And I know there were a couple of folks who um, I have on my list who did not make it. Um, so we do record these, um, particularly a lecture like this one that we know is um, very exciting and has lots of really great information. Um, so Kim, I'm just gonna make a note. Um, I will be in contact with you tomorrow and I will get you a copy of the recording. Jess asks, how do we reserve a time to come to the library and use this book scanner? Would someone be available to show me how to do it? So you do not need to reserve a time to come to the library. Um, we have lifted most of our COVID restrictions. So we're, we were appointment only for a little while, but we are not. So you're free to come by any time that the library is open. Um, the library is open Tuesday through Saturday. We're open Tuesday and Wednesday from 1 p.m. to 5 p.m. and then Thursday through Saturday from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. So if you come during that time, the book scanner should be free and one of our wonderful librarians will be able to help you and show you how to use it. It's such a great space in the museum. If you haven't come to visit it, I highly recommend just coming to see the museum or the, the library. It's a beautiful space in the museum. Oh. Well, thank you everybody for joining us. Uh, we're really excited and check out our website for any upcoming um, programs or hours for the library to come in and use that book scanner um, or just to learn a little bit more about what we have in our library um, and do research of your own. Um, there's lots of resources here for um, our community and our um, constituents. So we look forward to seeing you in our library very soon. Have a great night. Thank you everybody.